Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with man cakes. That's right, we're doing pancakes especially for men. And these very virile corn pancakes are spiked with green onions, bacon, and cheddar cheese. And they were amazing. And with Father's Day coming up soon, the timing could be perfect for giving this a try. So let me show you how to put this together. And the first step here is we're going to crisp up about a half a pound of bacon, which is never a bad way to start a recipe. So we're going to throw some sliced up bacon in a cold pan. We'll set that on medium heat and we'll cook that stirring occasionally until it's pretty much crisp. And if you start in a cold pan, that bacon gradually warms up. That fat kind of renders slowly out. And then in just a few short minutes, it should have enough fat to start sizzling away. And then, like I said, we're just going to continue cooking that until it's pretty crisp, pretty much done all the way. And I would think when you get to that point, it should look something like this. And at that point, we're going to do two things. We're going to turn off the heat and quickly dump in our green onions. And we'll give those a stir. And the reason we turn off the flame is because there's plenty of heat left in that bacon fat. And I really don't want to cook these green onions very much at all. I just want to soften them slightly. So we'll just turn off the heat, stir those around for a minute or two. And at that point, let's go ahead and transfer that mixture into a strainer so we can pretty much let all that fat drain off. And by the way, if you want these a little extra manly, we'll save a little bit of that bacon fat to fry our man cakes in. But anyway, like I said, we'll go ahead and let that drain, and it's on to mixing up our man cake batter, which, while quite manly, is also extremely easy. So all we're going to do is take a little bit of all-purpose flour, and to that we're going to add some cornmeal, and then a nice big spoon of baking powder, not soda. Repeat, baking powder, not soda. I'm also going to give it a pinch of freshly ground black pepper, and a little, little shake of cayenne. And then the last dry ingredient, a little bit of salt. And then before we mix in the wet ingredients, let's go ahead and take a whisk and mix these dry ingredients up to combine everything thoroughly. Doesn't take too much, half a minute's plenty. And once that's been done, we can go ahead and add the wet ingredients. The first of which would be two large eggs. I beat those first for some reason. You don't need to, you can just dump them in. We're also gonna add a little bit of melted butter and then a little touch of white sugar. And no, that is not a dry ingredient. As I've been told by the dessert bloggers, sugar is considered a wet ingredient. So anyway, a little touch of sugar, and then we'll finish off the wetness with some whole milk, and we'll take our whisk and we'll mix that up. Don't worry too much about overmixing, just mix it till it's combined. All right, these man cakes aren't very temperamental. And I know you're thinking with a name like man cakes, they sound kind of temperamental, but they're not. So we'll go ahead and give that a quick stir until it's just smooth. And at that point, we can go ahead and add our now drained and pretty cooled bacon and green onion mixture, along with a little handful of grated sharp cheddar cheese. And I'm using the white, you can use the orange if you want. But for me, I think the white cheddar makes for a nicer man cake color. But put in whatever you want. You're all the Sir Francis Drakes of your Food Wishes man cakes. So explore away. And then all we're going to do is take our whisk and give that a stir until that bacon mixture and cheese are combined. And that batter is pretty much ready. And while this is already pretty thick, what we want to do is let this sit here for about 10 minutes. All right, it's going to give those dry ingredients a chance to hydrate. And that pretty much goes for any pancake batter. It's generally better to let it sit a little before you try to cook it. And I'm going to go ahead and use one of these measuring cups to spoon mine out into the pan. So I'll go ahead and get that ready. And while we're waiting, we're going to do one extra step. I'm going to call it optional, but you really, really want to do this. We're going to take some maple syrup or syrup, if you enjoy extra syllables, and we're going to sprinkle in a little bit of chipotle pepper, which as you know, is a dried ground smoked jalapeno. So it's a little spicy, a little smoky, and that's going to work beautifully with the flavor profile of our man cakes. And once our maple syrup has been spiked with chipotle, and our batter has rested for about 10 minutes, we're ready to cook. So I have a large nonstick pan set on medium high heat, and I went with the holy trinity of breakfast fats, a little bit of vegetable oil, a little bit of butter, and a little bit of bacon fat. And once that gets hot, we're gonna go ahead and spoon in our man cake batter. About a quarter to a third of a cup of batter I think is plenty. And we're gonna go ahead and let those cook for two or three minutes before we flip them. And even though these are man cakes and not pancakes, we're still gonna look for the same clues about when to flip them. So the first thing you're looking for is that batter's gonna kinda of dry out around the outside, which means you're very close to bubbles actually coming up and popping up through the top. So when it looks like that and I can see those little bubbles forming, that generally means they're ready to flip, which these definitely were. So I gave those a flip, and then we'll give them a couple minutes on that side, and then go ahead and find Dad because we're almost ready to serve. I think he's hiding in the garage again. And of course we're gonna grab those in reverse order of beauty. So we'll go ahead and we'll put the least attractive one at the bottom, and then the next best looking one. And then of course on top, we'll put the best looking one. And in all honesty, is that something your dad would notice? No, never, which is one of the reasons we love dad so much. But you might as well do it because you know you're gonna be Instagramming this. And then once we've played it up, let's go ahead and drizzle over that chipotle spiced maple syrup that you've warmed slightly in the microwave. And we'll drizzle that over. You could, if you want to, sprinkle a few more green onions on top, just to warn everybody they're not about to eat regular pancakes. 
And then if your dad's the man you think he is, he's going to want you to dust over just a little more Chipotle. And at that point, your man cakes are done. Check it out. And as I grabbed the fork here, all I could think of was, man, I hope these taste as good as they look. And they totally did. These really were incredible. Even though the batter had a lot of cornmeal in it, which generally makes things much heavier, these still had a beautiful light texture. And as far as that sweet savory blend, I thought it was just perfect. Just enough bacon, just enough green onion. And like I said, that little bit of smoky heat in that maple syrup really, really put this over the top, okay? And it really is a shame there's no such thing as Father's Day brunch. Because if there was, this would be absolutely perfect for it. But regardless of whether you're making this for dad or not, I really do hope you give it a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Baked eggs. That's right. Don't let the generic boring name fool you. This is pretty exciting stuff. And I get tons of food wishes for new breakfast ideas. And this is kind of a breakfast idea, but I actually think I prefer this for like a lunch or dinner item. Regardless, it's eggs baked in a spicy sauce, and here is how you put it together. So maybe the most important ingredient is actually this dish. You need a heat-proof, oven-proof baking dish or ramekin. And of course, these things come in all shapes and sizes, but you're going to want one that will fit two eggs comfortably. And then into the bottom, we're going to spoon about a quarter inch or so of tomato sauce. Now, I'm just using my standard marinara sauce recipe. And by the way, I'm not measuring anything here. That's about, I don't know, a quarter cup, third of a cup. It's just not one of those measuring type recipes. So just make yours kind of look like mine and everybody's going to be fine. All right, once our tomato sauce is in there, we're going to season it up a little bit. I'm going to put some red pepper flakes. I like it a little spicy. You know that. And I'll also give it a little shot of black pepper and then maybe a little sprinkling of fresh herb. I have some Italian parsley. If you got fresh basil around, that of course would be great. All right. And then we're going to take a spoon and we're going to do the old trough trick. Take the edge of your spoon and just make a little trough in the middle, a little depression. That's where our eggs are going to sit. All right, once we've done that, we're going to place in our eggs, but be careful. Crack them into a ramekin first because you can't have any broken eggs in this. So crack it into a ramekin first. You can see if it broke or not. And if it didn't, then you can go ahead and slide it in. So the first one usually goes in no problem. The second one might move a little bit. So if it does, just take a spoon and carefully move it back towards the center. And that is what you're looking for. Once your eggs are in, this is going to get increasingly more and more sexy until it's done. So hang on to your seat. And here we go. All right, first we're going to give it a very, very generous dusting of Parmesan cheese. The real stuff from Italy. Parmigiano Reggiano. Crazy expensive, but worth every penny. So get the good stuff. And we want that finely grated and we want a good amount of it. Next, we'll give it a little drizzle of olive oil, a couple teaspoons, something nice, and then over that, a drizzling of heavy cream. And by the way, check out that trick. Open the cream, close it back up, and when you tip it over, it acts like a little drizzling spout. A little restaurant trick for you. You probably already knew that. All right, after that glorious drizzling of cream, we're going to season it with a little touch of salt, and that's going to go in a 400 degree oven. Make sure it's preheated for 10 to 12 minutes until it's just set. All right, if you give it a little shake, the only thing that should be wiggling is the yolks and maybe a little bit of the white around the yolks. See that? The yolks should not be runny, which I know surprises some of you. They should just barely be set. The problem is if you leave the yolks runny, you basically get like an eggy tomato sauce. And this is not supposed to be a dish of tomato sauce. It's supposed to be a dish of baked eggs in tomato sauce. And by letting the yolks just get barely firm like this, you have the optimum textural situation. Okay, so to eat this, we're going to take the tip of our spoon and we're going to mix that yolk into that just barely set white. So I'm just going to mix it up like that. I'm not going to mix too much of that cheesy, creamy, tomatoey mixture into it. I'm mostly just mixing white and yolk there. And as we eat this, we'll incorporate that amazing tomato mixture. All right, once I've mixed my yolk and my white together, I'm going to season this up with a touch more salt, a little bit of cayenne, maybe a little more fresh herb. And that is pretty spectacular. And by the way, there's two kinds of people in the world. Those that think this looks awesome and those we don't want to party with. So hopefully you're in the first group. Now it was awesome on the end of a fork. I couldn't resist tasting. But of course this is made for toasted bread. It really is just magnificent. By the way, Father's Day brunch idea. This would be great. Dad's not so much into the Eggs Benedict and the, you know, Quiche Lorraine. Dad wants a brunch recipe that's got more huevos to it. And this dish has huevos, literally and figuratively. 
So I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Tuscan style flank steak. That's right, Father's Day is coming up, and I wanted to do an extra special steak for all the dads out there. And I really love flank steak as a cut for the grill. And here we're going to marinate it in lemon, black pepper, garlic, and rosemary. And we're also going to do a very simple lemon dressing to serve it with. That's right, two recipes for the same low price as one. All right, first step here. Anytime you're using zest and lemon juice in a recipe, always zest first because it's too hard to zest something after you squeeze it. So I'm going to zest a couple lemons. And then in a blender, we're going to start our marinade, which is fresh rosemary leaves, lots of garlic, some freshly ground black pepper, some red pepper flakes, some of that freshly squeezed lemon juice. We're going to pour in some olive oil and a big pinch of salt. And that's it. Very simple yet extremely powerful marinade. All right, the magic is strong in this one. So we're going to take that over to the blender and we're going to process that until completely smooth. And once that's processed, just set it aside until our steak is prepped. Speaking of which, there is our gorgeous flank steak. Now that is worthy of a Father's Day celebration. A giant hunk of meat, pretty much 100% edible. You get these from the butcher fully trimmed. And before we marinate it, we're going to get a little bit stabby with it. So I want you to take a fork and I want you to give it between, I don't know, like 28 and 32 stabs. And that's going to help the marinade absorb into the meat. So after you've given it the prescribed number of punctures, I want you to pour over the marinade, spread it over with a fork. You want to flip that over several times so both sides are coated equally. And then we're going to wrap that with plastic and refrigerate that for between four and eight hours. All right, as I say with all these marinade recipes, longer or shorter marinating times at your own risk. Okay, so while that's in the fridge, we're going to make a very simple lemon dressing. So for this, I'm going to use a mason jar. You can use a whisk in a bowl if you want it to be harder and messier. But this is the easiest way for me. We're going to throw in the lemon zest we did earlier, along with some finely minced rosemary. Be careful. Rosemary is one of those herbs you can definitely add too much of. I'm going to throw in some pepper flakes, some more of that freshly squeezed lemon juice, and of course some olive oil, another pinch of salt. Screw the top on and give it a vigorous and proper shaking. I'm talking one minute, no stopping and that will emulsify it. And you wanna shake it again for a minute before you serve it, and that's done. All right, so fast forward about five or six hours later for me, and my marination duration was done, and I was ready to grill. I like to kinda of scrape off any of the obvious excess marinade. A little bit on there is great, but if you have big, thick globs, kinda of scrape it off with the tongs. I'm gonna to reseason mine with some salt and pepper. We're gonna head outside, and we're gonna place that on our very well preheated, Charcoal grill. I right, don't even think of calling this Tuscan unless you cook it over some coals. This really should be over a smoky charcoal fire. And I'm going to grill it about six minutes per side. That seems to work for me. And of course, if you want to give it those grill marks by giving it a half turn, make sure you wait at least three or four minutes. Otherwise, the meat is not going to be released from those grates yet. So right there, mine was okay. I gave it a turn. So after about six minutes, I flipped mine. And six minutes is a long time to wait for a steak to finish cooking. So while you're waiting, here's a project. Take a little bit of that dressing we made, a couple tablespoons, put it in a ramekin, and then grab some rosemary sprigs, and then just go ahead and brush that over the top. It will make it all shiny and luscious looking. It will keep it moist and flavorful. So like I say, you got six minutes. Why wouldn't you do that? Come on. All right, so right there, mine was done. I go for about 120 inside of the thickest part, which is a little rare, but I'll show you why I do that in a minute. And of course, please, for the love of dad, let this rest at least six, seven minutes. Because if you cut this open hot, it's just going to pour out on the cutting board and it won't be as awesome. So at this point, mine is rested. I'm going to make sure I find the grain, which runs lengthwise. And I'm going to cut it down the middle just like that. Because these are much easier to slice if you cut it in half first. Then we're going to cut across against the grain. Now you can see here why I take mine off at 120 in the thickest part, because that's going to be rare, but you see how that tapers down? Flank steak is great for a party, because there's going to be everything from medium well all the way up to rare on the same piece of meat. And then we're simply going to slice each of those long rectangles crossways against the grain, just like that. We're going to put it on a plate. We're going to drizzle on some of that super awesome dressing, maybe some more freshly cracked black pepper. And that was a thing of beauty. I served it with some roasted red pepper and potatoes, and it really is as juicy and tender as it looks. In fact, dad will like this so much, he'll be thinking as he's eating, 
maybe they do love me and don't just use me for, you know, money and shelter. That's how good it is. So I hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Grilled German potato salad. That's right, we're going to make a potato salad using grilled potatoes. Which I'm sure comes as a huge disappointment to the people that thought we were going to make a German potato salad and then grill it. Which is not the case. You only make that mistake once. But anyway, if you're still watching, this really did come out amazingly well. And to get this started, what we'll do is grill some potatoes until tender. And I say grill, but what we're really going to do is roast these on the grill. And to accomplish that, what we'll do once these are down is go ahead and close the cover. And we'll try to keep our heat about the same as we'd use in the oven if we were roasting these. I'm thinking something around 375 would be perfect. And what we should probably do every once in a while while these are roasting is go ahead and give them a flip. And by the way, as far as timing goes, I'm doing this on a grill I cooked chicken on earlier, and I'm basically using up those leftover coals. And then we could either serve this later with another meal or make it ahead for the next day. But let's say you're doing something like a brisket or a pork shoulder that takes a long time. You could actually do these potatoes while that's cooking and make this to go alongside it. But regardless, we will go ahead and roast these until just tender, which is almost impossible to gauge by time since potatoes are going to come in all different shapes and sizes. So what we'll do to check these is test them with a wooden skewer. And what we're shooting for, like I said, is something that's just barely tender. Okay, we don't want soft and falling apart, but we really, really, really don't want undercooked. All right, there's literally nothing worse than a potato salad with undercooked potatoes. So as soon as these are just barely tender as tested with a skewer, we'll go ahead and pull those off. And then we will bring those inside and let them sit until they're cool enough to handle. And by handle, I mean eventually we will peel them and slice them. And while those are cooling, we should have just enough time to make our hot bacon dressing, which we will start by adding a whole bunch of sliced bacon to this cold dry pan. And we will set that over medium heat. And we're gonna to wanna to cook that bacon until crisp or very close to it. And by the way, there's good fonds, there's great fonds, and then there's bacon fonds. So if you're using a stainless steel pan, you should notice a very substantial buildup of that caramelized goodness on the bottom, which once deglazed is gonna add a ton of flavor to our dressing. But anyway, we'll go ahead and continue to cook on medium. And one great visual clue you're getting close is that grease in the pan starts to appear a little bit foamy. All right, so when your pan starts to look like this, your bacon is probably getting very close to the perfect crispiness. And if so, what we'll do is grab a slotted spoon and we will remove exactly half. And as you'll see, we'll use that to top our salad later. But in the meantime, what we'll do is add a diced onion to the bacon left in the pan, along with, of course, all that rendered bacon fat. And what we'll do is continue to cook this on medium until our onions turn translucent and sort of soften up a little bit. And since that's probably going to take about five minutes or so, what we can do while that's happening is go ahead and peel and slice our potatoes, which by now should be cool enough to handle. And I should mention the peeling's optional but that skin really does come off quite easily, especially after you've grilled them. So I'm gonna go ahead and peel that off and then cut this potato in half lengthwise and then eventually into quarters. And then as per usual, we'll turn that and cut across into whatever thickness slices we want. And I'll generally shoot for something between a quarter and a half inch. Okay, if they're too thin, they're gonna turn into mashed potatoes when we mix them with the dressing. And if they're too thick, the dressing won't penetrate as well. But anyway, that's gonna be up to you. I mean, you guys are, after all, the Donny Deutsches of these kinds of choices. But what you're seeing here is what I think personally is the optimum size. And that's it. We'll transfer those potatoes to a mixing bowl, where they are now ready to be drenched with our soon-to-be-finished dressing. So we'll head back to the stove, where by now our onions should be done. And then once we've determined our onions have cooked long enough, we'll go ahead and add the rest of the ingredients, which will include some white sugar, or as I've started to call it, the devil's salt. And then we're also going to need some actual salt and its good friend freshly ground black pepper. And then we'll finish up our seasonings with a little bit of cayenne pepper, or cayenne pfeffer, as they call it back in the old country. And then to finish this up, we will go ahead and add enough white vinegar, specifically in my case champagne vinegar, to perfectly balance the bacon fat in the pan. And how much vinegar you need exactly depends, of course, on how much bacon fat you have in the pan. But for the half pound of bacon I'm using, I find about a half cup is perfect. And what we'll do is stir that in. And of course, that's going to deglaze whatever goodness is left on the bottom. And at this point, we can go ahead and raise our heat to medium high. And then all we're going to have to do to finish this dressing is simply wait for it to come to a boil. And that's it. As soon as it starts bubbling, 
We'll give it a stir and turn off the heat. And our hot bacon dressing is now officially ready to use. And yes, you can absolutely make this ahead of time and reheat it. But I want grilled German potato salad now. So let's go ahead and pour that over our potatoes. And then we'll go ahead and give that a toss to combine. And what I like to do after giving it this first initial tossing is let it sit for five minutes and give it one more mixing. At which point we can add the final ingredient, some freshly chopped Italian parsley. And by giving it a couple mixings and letting it sit for a little bit before we add this, I think our parsley might stay a little greener. But anyway, we will mix in our fresh parsley. And that's it, other than giving this a taste for salt, I think we're done. So I went ahead and took a little taste, and I'm happy to report it was perfect. Which means we can go ahead and serve this up into something a little more presentable. And we'll go ahead and garnish the top with a little extra parsley. As well as, of course, our reserved crispy bacon. And then, for no apparent reason, a little extra parsley. And that's it, what I'm calling grilled German potato salads done. And ready to enjoy, hopefully, while still warm. And why that's kind of a big deal is because cold bacon fat will coat your palate, and it will not taste as good. Which, by the way, is why it works so well for summer cookouts, since unlike most other potato salads, this actually gets better sitting in the sun. And then as far as the taste goes, we have a beautiful balance between sweet and tangy, which may not sound like it works incredibly well with potatoes. But when you include all that beautiful smoky bacon, it really does work beautifully. But what really takes us up to the next level is that subtle smokiness from the potatoes. So I really did thoroughly enjoy this. Although I did decide I probably should stop eating out of the bowl, and I plated some up next to some burnt chicken so I could take a few more bites. And by the way, that wasn't really burnt. That was from a Koji Rub chicken experiment I mentioned on Twitter a while back that, as you can see, I'm still perfecting. But anyway, that's it. Grilled German potato salad. Whether you're one of these people that just doesn't like mayonnaise, or maybe you need a potato salad that can sit on a sunny picnic table for like four hours without making anyone sick, or neither of those things, and you're just looking for an intensely delicious potato salad, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Garlic steak with garlic. That's right, steak with a double shot of garlic. This is kind of a Father's Day special because, you know, what father doesn't love steak? And what father wouldn't like steak even more with tons of garlic on it? So I have two New York strip steaks I'm working with. You can do this with pretty much any steak. But you know what? It's Father's Day. Treat your dad to some nice steak. Don't buy yours at a supermarket like I did. Look at that. There's no marbling. Nothing says, I don't really love you, dad, like under-marbled meat. Go to a butcher and get some real steaks. So we're going to put our steaks in a Ziploc bag with lots of black pepper, a little shot of olive oil, something fairly mild, and then lots of garlic. I'm talking like eight cloves of crushed garlic. The amount is up to you. So if your dad likes tons of garlic, put more. I'm going to give that a nice massage. Make sure it's all evenly coated. You don't want a big clump of garlic on one end and none on the other. So take a couple minutes. Give it a good rub down. All right, you want to just rub it, rub it, rub it, like borderline inappropriate amount of rubbing. So that's all nice and evenly spread. I'm going to take that, put it in the refrigerator, for about eight hours, all right? Overnight, in a pinch, you could go five or six hours, but overnight's best. While that is marinating, we're gonna make some pan-roasted garlic cloves. Now, I'm gonna do a longer version of this procedure and give more detail, but it's very simple. It's a whole bunch of peeled garlic cloves in a saucepan, covered with olive oil, and cooked on the lowest heat setting you have for about a half hour until they turn golden brown, soft, sweet and delicious okay so roasted garlic is the opposite of fresh garlic it is not harsh it is not hot it is not biting it is very mellow and delicious so that is perfect i'm gonna set that aside now we're on to the steaks all right of course you're gonna fire up your grill get it nice and hot i'm gonna pull that bag out of the refrigerator i'm gonna scrape off most of the surface garlic so i'm gonna remove most of the garlic with my tongs I'm going to re-season, of course, all right, some salt, maybe some more pepper, up to you. Maybe sneak a little cayenne in there. Does dad like cayenne? It's a great sign if your dad likes cayenne. It means you come from good stock. All right, we're heading out to the grill. We're going to grill that, you know, five, six minutes per side. Depends on how you like it. By the way, let dad grill. Don't think you're doing dad a favor because it's Father's Day. 
and you're going to grill for him. He doesn't want you to grill for him. Give him a beer, give him the tongs, let him grill his own darn steaks. So this is not a grilling demo. Figure it out, grill your steaks, you know, medium rare, medium. You know how I like it, a little pink in the middle. When those are done, take them off and let them rest. I'm sure your father taught you growing up, you gotta let your meat rest. Do not cut into meat fresh off the grill. All the juices will run out. You don't want that, especially on Father's Day. All right, to finish, we are gonna take a spoon of balsamic vinegar and just spread it over the top. Why? Because the garlic is soft and sweet and rich and it's in that olive oil. So we need something to kind of balance this out. If you're starting a band, you don't like go all guitars. You gotta have a little bass and some drums. And you know what? That's not a good analogy, but you know what I'm saying. Last step, I'm gonna take those soft, sweet garlic cloves. And those are just room temperature. They just were sitting in that pan of oil. I'm gonna put those on the top. How many? I did three. Depends on how garlicky you want it. You could put anywhere between one and 30. And of course, we're gonna give it a few drops of that amazing roast garlic oil. And then you know what's coming next. We're gonna cut into it and eat it. Which by the way, I'm blocking the shot. So I switched to this angle. And then, yes, I was still kind of blocking the shot. And then finally, I got the angle right. And there's your beautiful pink grilled to perfection piece of meat, marinated in garlic, covered in garlic, un believable your father is going to be so proud of you if you make this and of course by proud i mean slightly less disappointed which is all any of us can hope for okay so happy father's day to all you dads out there i hope you give this a try all the ingredients are on foodwishes.com as usual and as always enjoy Some more ice cream pie. That's right, we're turning s'mores into a Father's Day inspired dessert. And I'll explain that in more detail on the blog. But basically a s'more is one of the few desserts your father actually knows the recipe for. And he'll associate it with so many things men love. Building fires, carving pointy sticks, skewering things, and so forth. So I think this is going to be the perfect Father's Day dessert. And we're going to start off with a very manly step. We're going to have to crush some graham crackers. Now you could do these in a plastic bag with like a mallet or a rolling pin or something like that. That's not manly. Get in there with your bare hands and crush those into a fine crumb, something like that. And at that point, we're gonna add some white granulated sugar and some melted butter, and then just take your spoonula and mix that until well combined. At that point, we're gonna go ahead and transfer that into a pie dish. I think this is your standard nine inch size. And we're simply gonna use our spatula to spread that out as evenly as we can. And I always find making graham cracker crust very therapeutic. That mixture is going to remind you of wet sand. And wet sand is going to remind you of building sandcastles, which will remind you of the tide coming in before you were done and wrecking the whole thing. Good times on the beach. And when you have that spread as evenly as you think you can get it with the spatula or spoonula, just switch to the bare hands and try to even everything out. I like to go around the outside and kind of smooth it out a little bit, make it a little nicer looking. Will dad notice? No. That's not the point. And once I've done those edges and everything's nice and smooth, I'm gonna go ahead and pop that in the fridge for at least a half hour until it's well chilled. And at that point, we're gonna fill it with chocolate ice cream. Now I want you to let the ice cream soften a little bit, but not a ton. Because the best method for this is to scoop it in with a little ice cream scoop like this. And as you scoop, the ice cream is gonna get softer and softer. And by the time you scoop it out, all the soft stuff will be very easy to nestle into the harder scoops below. And another reason I like this method is because if you just plopped everything in there and tried to spread it, you'd probably tear up your crust and break your crust up. And did you want a broken crust? Of course not. So that's why I like this method. Once I've transferred all the ice cream in, I'm going to switch to a spatula and smooth out the top best I can. All right. And then once that's smoothed out nicely, we're going to go ahead and place a ring of mini marshmallows all the way around the outside, around the outside, around the outside to make kind of a border. And once we've gone all the way around... We can go ahead and just fill in the center, all right, three or four handfuls, whatever it takes to cover the top. Pretty much a single layer. But if you have a few extra here and there, of course that's not a problem. No one's ever said, hey, dude, there's too many marshmallows on your s'more ice cream pie. All right, so don't worry about that. And then once you have total coverage, I want you to gently press those down into the surface just to settle those into the ice cream layer. And then that whole thing's going to go into the freezer for at least, at least an hour or two. Longer's even better. We want this very firm before we toast our marshmallows. And at that point, you can pull it out of the freezer. And then it's time for what I'm predicting will be Dad's favorite part of this operation. The burning of the top. 
And we're not using any fancy creme brulee torch from that fancy gourmet shop, which costs like 50 bucks and is half the size of a real blowtorch. We're going to use an actual blowtorch, hopefully from your dad's workshop. But if not, find yourself a blowtorch and go over the top. So as you see, I'm moving it around very quickly, trying to get an even burn. And don't worry about black spots. It has to have the black spots. A real s'more is done with a perfectly charred marshmallow. That's such an important part of the flavor. So I want you to do it at least as dark as I'm doing it. And if I wasn't filming this, I'm going to be honest, I would do it darker. So you're going to keep that moving. You're not going to stay on any one spot too long. All right, if part of it catches on fire, blow it out. And that's what mine looked like when it was done. And then I'm going to recommend you put this back in the freezer until it firms up enough to slice. You could probably slice it now and serve it. But it really is going to be a lot easier if you give it a few hours. And you can see here, if you do chill it, you'll get nice, fairly clean slices. And there you can see those classic three layers of the s'more. The graham cracker, the chocolate, and the toasted marshmallow. So like I said, I really think dads are going to like this. They'll associate it with camping and having to build the fire. They love to do that kind of stuff. And of course, it tasted exactly like a frozen s'more. Just a classic combination of flavors. Oh, and by the way, if someone asks for seconds and they say, can I have some more pie? You have to say, which one? And then they say, some more. And you're like, yeah, I know, which one? That's so funny and it will not grow tiresome at all. Trust me, okay? So whether you're trying this for Father's Day or not, I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Bye.